And so if anyone doesn't want their presence recorded, if they could unname themselves and switch themselves off video, then they will be invisible. I hope that's okay. But without further ado, I'm going to kick off tonight. I'm Chris Church for Oxford Friends of the Earth, and I'm going to be co-facilitating this with Jackie penning Russell. But it's clean air day today, so we thought we might just start. Whoop. Sorry, that's very unprofessional. Let's start at the beginning. Clean air day, what's going on? We've got a range of speakers, but first as a short update, then we'll have Kayla, Lynn and Felix. Tom Hayes should be joining us at 6.45 and Jenny will be final speaker at seven. And then we have some time for discussion on where we go next. It's worth remembering this is about the county. There's Oxford and seven other towns that have got problems and Despite some decline in recent years, those problems aren't disappearing. And it's good that we've been out, people have been out across the county today, as I can show you. Um, that's Hook Norton, Wallingford, and Tom, I think that's the Rawlinson Road Nursery. Um, all looking very enthusiastic, yeah. and which is encouraging. And also Botley, Banbury and East Oxford School. Anyone got any points to make about what they were doing today? Feel free to um, unmute yourself, raise your hand and um, slide in. David. Hi, dear, from Henley. Uh, today I've been uh, matching out where we're going to put some more diffusion tubes because one half of Henley hasn't got really good monitoring. So we're going to decide, the town council have agreed to, to do that instead of the district council. And I've been also putting up our banners around the town, which are about no idling. Uh, and we've now linked it with COVID because there's quite a strong links between people who suffer from air pollution getting serious COVID. So uh, we've been putting those banners out today. Right. Jane, do you want to talk us through what you've been doing in Banbury? Well, um, as you could see from the, the photo, um, we, we, took, we took the photo on Hennef Way, which is actually over double the legal limit um, for um, nitrogen dioxide and, and for particulate matter. It's a very dangerous road and it's heaving with traffic. You know, we didn't go at rush hour. It's, it's like that constantly. Um, lorries thundering past. So it's a particularly horrid road and it's been a, a sore point in Banbury for a long time. Um, and then, as I said before, we, we, we did some work in schools, um, getting schools to uh, look at the, the, the clean air information packs. And we had um, very good uptake from two schools in particular. We had over 60 entries of um, posters that the children made uh, for, for clean air day. And I just picked a few to show you tonight, but the judge is actually picking the winning ones um, at the moment. It was for ele it was for um, it was for five to eleven year olds. So um, yeah, the the the. Uh, it certainly little... looks like a good range, and I rather like the enough. Hi, darling. <laughs> Sorry, um, I just had to mute someone. Yes, right. no, okay. So thank you. That's it. That's it. Okay, right. So the stuff going on, if anyone has got more photos, please do send them in. The Oxford Mail have taken some of the photos, so we are hopeful there will be some coverage tomorrow. Chris, just let's report move on. From, can I just report from Wallingford briefly, Chris? Yes, certainly. Um, five of us went out with banners into the centre of the town at I lunchtime. Think that's you in the top right. Yes, that's us in the top right. And we went down the high street, which is the um, particularly bad um, air quality zone uh, down to the down to the bridge. Um, there was being lunchtime, there was relatively little traffic around. So we didn't get lots of traffic, but you can see there are buses in the background. 
Um, yeah, so we just used it as a photo opportunity. There weren't many people around either, but lunchtime was all we could manage. Well, no, I think it's been a bit of a miserable day, and but it's been a good one, I think. And we've had a lot of interest. So let's move on to our first speaker, who is Kayla Schult, Jackie. Right. Um, yes, Kayla uh, Schulte is um, studying for a DPhil at the University of Oxford, and um, she is a social scientist. So she's taking a very social scientific approach and an innovative one to the problem of air pollution. And uh, she's also been working closely with us in um, Oxford Friends of the Earth on our clean air campaign. So Kayla, please tell us about your research. Um, please cut me off too if, if, I, if I start rambling. Um, but yes, um, as Jackie said, I've been a member of Oxford Friends of the Earth for two or three years now, uh, and I work on air pollution issues, specifically uh, information, sharing of information about air pollution through digital channels. Uh, so that's kind of my specialty, and I'm really interested in more of the lived experience of air pollution and how we can kind of capture that alongside um, quantitative air pollution data, so data collected with sensors or monitors. Um, and I'm here today to share a little bit about progress from the Oxair project. Um, I am a member of the steering committee, and um, I don't know if any other folks from the Oxair project are attending, um, but uh, I'm just going to share a little bit about the project for those of you who aren't aware of it. Um, it originally came together about a year and a half ago when a team of environmental scientists, representatives from the city, city council, um, county council, public health, and social science researchers uh, decided to apply for funding and receive funding from DEFRA to trial a set of portable air quality monitors. Uh, unfortunately, the funding was only limited to Oxford City, and the goal is to kind of have this be a, a pilot um, that, you know, we can kind of accumulate some lessons learned and, and then spread out uh, throughout the rest of the county. So that is absolutely the goal because obviously air pollution doesn't stop um, at city boundary lines or ward lines. Um, so the goal, the overarching goal of the Oxair project was to generate reliable air quality data from a human perspective. Um, as some of you might be familiar with, um, there's this, uh, there's this concern on the part of air quality managers um, and folks in, in the government that um, air quality data collected using portable monitors is, is um, not of good quality. So it's a really big deal that DEFRA um, provided funding for this because it means that you know, they're kind of opening their eyes to the possibility um, and the reality that we live um, in a time where we have advanced technology that can capture air quality data. Um, the current state of um, air quality management, local air quality management relies on the stationary monitors around the city. Oxford's very lucky that it has three in the city, but once you spread out to the county, I mean, it's, it's like um, they're having to base it on sophisticated modeling, um, electronic diffusion tubes, and it would be really great if we had um, portable, uh, had data from portable air quality monitors um, at our disposal that was also trustworthy. Um, so um, what we did was we employed a fleet of 25 nitrogen dioxide and particulate matter sensors, um, as well as electronic diffusion tubes in partnership with local businesses and organizations um, across Oxford, including Oxford Bus Company. So we had sensors on the buses. Um, Pedal and Post carried them, Oxwash carried them, some taxi drivers, and also some um, a group of local residents. Um, so now the project is drawing to a close, which means that we're done with our um, monitoring period. Um, and, you know, it, it was very much an experiment. Um, these sensors were finicky 
uh, we collected some really cool and interesting data and we're just now preparing to um, make it all available. Um, unfortunately, our dream of having, you know, a Google style map where you can, um, you know, select a time of day um, and it'll show you what air pollution is typically like then or like in real time um, just isn't possible with the, the amount of data that we collected. We didn't collect enough for that sort of thing. Um, you know, you have to be kind of constantly um, running around with these monitors um, or you have to model it, um, which is a whole different ball game. Um, I know uh, London Air does this, uh, which is something that Oxford might consider. Um, I think it should consider. <laughs> um, there are ways that, 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 this, um, that this can be invested in. Um, so, so yes, I just want to... Oops. The outputs. Uh, You've frozen a bit, K Kayla. Whoops. Is that, can anyone else hear her? No. I love no. Her. Ah. Well, there you go. Classic. Um, okay. Um, this is unfortunate because she's due to unveil the local anecdotes map people's stories about air pollution. Um, I think it's Kayla's line that's probably going to be the problem. What? And it looks like Kayla has now left. Let's hope she comes back. To keep us moving, I'm wondering if we could bring in another voice, um, which would be Lynn. Lynn, would you be available to? Yeah. Okay. Jackie. Right. Um, okay. Yes, we're really pleased to welcome Lynn tonight. Lynn is um, a head teacher in Headington in Oxford, and she has been pioneering work on air pollution and climate change with the children in her school, which is Windmill Primary School. And um, she's done wonderful work with them, and we really hope that other schools will follow her example. Um, so thank you very much, Lynn, for finding the time in your extremely busy day to um, come and be with us this evening. Thank you. No, it's my pleasure. And actually, you know, I, I firmly believe that schools have a really big part to play in moving forward with the whole campaign against anti-idling and getting a cleaner city for Oxford. So I think in terms of schools, there are three different areas in which we need to be far more proactive. So in terms of the actual curriculum that we're teaching, there is flexibility to teach aspects of climate change and the environmental impacts of what's happening. And we, every school has the flexibility to input this into their curriculum that they're teaching to every class. And I think we can use maybe the experiences that other schools have where they've been very successful to support schools who aren't quite sure how to do this. So every school designs its curriculum. It is that takes the content of the national curriculum and decides where it goes. And I think we have taken a strong stance at Windmill and saying that within every year group, there will be an element of environmental teaching, including campaigns towards making sure children understand why pollution why we climate change are such key factors at the moment that we need to be thinking about considering and then taking action about so even in assemblies as a head teacher i can lead thought processes with children about what can they do to make a difference to their local area in terms of improving the atmosphere improving the way in which we run our school to reduce the impact of climate change and every head teacher has the capacity to do that so education i think is key if we don't educate children about why climate change and anti-idling and pollution are key elements that we need to be focusing on and understanding the impact that it has on their health on the atmosphere on the whole 
local environment, then they are never going to be in a position to make changes themselves. And I do believe that children should be taught that they can, as individuals, make a difference. So when you see here in this photograph, Holly and Poppy, they care desperately about the environment and they entered the competition um, that was went out last March to design the poster. And that's their winning poster, in fact, they, were, they won it. And through the education, I hope, and the curriculum we've given the children, they are passionate about the environment and they do want to make a difference and so we can influence that by saying that it's it's very easy to say I'm just one person I can't do anything it's up to politicians it's up to the government no it isn't it's up to us to influence the people who make the decisions and so as children in schools I think we're starting to see how powerful they can be so in terms of plastics, you know, many children have written to manufacturers of toys, McDonald's, um, I, Red, Red Nose Day, I gather, have been very strongly influenced by children in schools, writing letters and saying, we want less plastic. Well, I think we can use that power with children as well to write to local councillors, to write to um, other people in the community saying, we want cleaner air because it actually impacts on our health. So we can campaign as well. And therefore, you can have campaigns on your school gate. So we've run two anti-idling campaigns now out in our school gate. And in the mornings, we've been coming out with banners. And we've actively been going up to parents and saying, please turn your engine off. You're idling. It's making our road into a dirty, health, unhealthy place to be. And again, children actually are very influential with their parents. So I saw parents literally change their behavior because their child was nagging them and they would see us coming and they would turn their engines off and then they would apologize because it started to raise the awareness of which many adults just don't seem aware, I think, of the impact of what's happening. And therefore their children are in a very strong position to educate them. And I think we can use that power that children have to really change the minds of their families as well. And then I also think we can raise the profile with our wider community. So we're hoping we, we should be a pilot for a road closure scheme so that the plan is that when children are arriving at school in the morning and when they're leaving home at the end of the day, our area, our roads outside school are gonna be closed. And that starts to raise awareness with our local residents. And I think that's an opportunity then for the children in the school to write to those local residents and explain why it is we, we want this road closure, why it's so important to everybody who lives in that community around our school. So again, I think we can influence far beyond just the parents and the children within Winmore Primary School. I believe that through educating our residents who live around our school, we can also start to spread the word and hopefully that will then make them more proactive in actually thinking what could they do differently to improve the air quality of the area that they live in. And then of course there's the practical things about getting children to cycle, to walk to school rather than coming in the car. And again, I think a lot of that comes down to pressure from children saying to their parents, we want to walk today, you know, it's better for us, and actually highlighting the health benefits to being physically active and the other impact of improving the air quality around the school. So I think schools can do an awful lot to move this forward. And I'm more than happy in my role within the county as a head teacher to support other schools who want to make a difference because together, collectively, we are going to be far more powerful in making a change. So that's all I wanted to say really, because I think it's very much about being proactive and not just sitting back and hoping that everybody else is going to do it for us because they're not going to. We've got to take the lead ourselves. That's wonderful. Thank you, Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Um, uh, if Jackie, can we look to our, if people want to stick their hand up or use the reaction button we will um try and come to you um, anyone got questions for 
Rachel, I can see. Oh, um, thank you very much, Lynn. That was um, great to hear. Um, I was just wondering how it all kind of started with you. Is it something that you've um, always had throughout your kind of teaching, you know, whenever you've been a teacher, then you're going up to head teacher. Is it something you've always felt strongly about or is it since becoming a head teacher that you've really kind of embraced it or just, is it just... I think it's something I, I feel passionate about anyway, personally. And I can remember teaching climate change right back in the 1990s. And I think what scares me is that at that time, it was all about greenhouse gases. And we, you know, Blue Peter did an amazing book on um, changing your environment and you know all the different things we could do as individuals to make a difference to the environment. And what scares me is that none of it's changed. We're 20 years on and we're still where we were back in the 1990s and I think so although I feel passionate about it I think as a head teacher which I wasn't a head then I was a teacher in a classroom I think I'm in a position to make more of a difference because I can it's a privilege as a school leader to be able to create the curriculum that I feel matters to the our school community and I'm fortunate as well to have parents and families who feel as passionate as I do about it and therefore I have got that root support, if you like, to help me move things on. So, you know, we, they've been, many, many parents have supported us going into Oxford to go and campaign for um, clean air and to make sure that children are aware of global changes. And so they want us to make this difference to their children. And that makes a huge difference. I was in contact with um, a chair of, the chair of, or he was a governor at a school in, Gloucestershire and when we went to clean air day last year we must have been on the radio somewhere and he picked up on the work that we were doing and contacted me but he could not get any of his fellow governors or the head teacher of that school to want to make a difference and so he was feeling very frustrated by it but was very keen to see what we were doing and I think it's how we get over that barrier of people thinking well we've got to get through this curriculum we've got to get through the maths and the English but actually you can build it all in and I think that's where I can support in seeing helping other schools to see that you can build it in without it being something extra but actually the buy-in from the children is enormous and I think it's really powerful that way. Are there already things in place where head teachers can can discuss this is it something that naturally basically i've got my children are at sand hills um so um i was just trying to think how it naturally might work is it that they have to kind of reach out to you or is there already kind of a whole you know do people talk anyway as heads around the area there are partnership groups so we're part of the um headington partnership so um and sand hills i know sits with wheatley partnership uh, okay but you know there are ways we could influence the discussion in those partnership meetings for example so we you know i have people come to our headington partnership meeting saying can we come and talk about such and such they you know something they want to promote and we invite those people in and i would be more than happy to go and talk to partnerships about what we've done if there was an interest within those school groups to see what they could do differently thank you okay, okay. we're gonna have to move on and i'm glad that we've got kayla back hi i'm so sorry about that right. I was screaming at my computer. Um, uh, just jump right back in because I, I want to get through it all. I was just about to present um, a few of the key data centric and thought centric outputs that came out of the project. Um, and um, so one of them to mention, we collected data outside a number of schools and I saw that Jake chimed in. Um, where we were actually collecting data outside of Windmill. Um, the sharing of this data is gonna be coordinated with those respective schools and we'll be working with Jackie as well to develop a plan for, for next steps. Um, in addition to this, the raw data that we collected throughout the project will be available for download, um, keeping in mind that we did our best with the help and advice of our resident focus group to map areas of interest across the city. but. Inevitably, we weren't able to monitor everything. Um, so what we came up with as a group is um, uh, the officer open map of air quality anecdotes. Um, it was just one of the motivations for this. So let me show you. Um, and this, um, this tool is open to um, residents of Oxfordshire um, wide. Uh, and um, 
you, if you go to this link and I'll share it in the chat, um, viewer.matme.com slash Oxford, Oxford air quality map, open map, um, you can add your anecdote, um, we anecdote about uh, uh, air pollution across Oxford city and Oxfordshire. It's, it's open. <sighs> Am I cutting out again? Okay. Um, we can hear I, you. I, I hope you can all see it. Okay. Um, so it's it's an open map and um, it's it's anonymous. So you can add your anonymous anecdote. And um, if you step through the anecdotes that are currently on there, you can agree with them. You can show your agreement by clicking. Um, so we'll start to develop. Uh, a bit of an evidence in terms of areas where people um, experience, have common experiences of poor air quality across Oxford. Um, so when you main page do um, a form where you enter in your information, um, you can, um, it's not loading fully properly right now, but um, a map loads. I'm currently in Paris at the moment, so that's why that's showing up. Um, and you can, um, it'll then record your coordinates and you can submit it um, and we'll receive it and then we'll input it directly into the map. So we are reviewing the submissions that we get, um, but we'll we turn it around really quickly. Uh, and we're just hoping that this tool can be shared widely and we're going to track it over the course of the year to see whether it gains traction. Um, another big motivation behind this tool is that we can try and collect that are typically represented when we're having conversations about air quality. I mean, if you look around, it's, it's parents um, and <laughs> the goal behind a wider audience. Um, another tool that we're doing um, alongside some of the data that the resident participants live yet. Their main Sorry, Kayla, we really are starting Sarah to lose you. Website. Um, okay, everybody. Um, just, just follow oxair.org and um, I'm going to share the link for the open map. Chat. And, and try it out. I'd love to hear. Okay. Well, thanks for that. And I'm really sorry it's disrupted. Please do stay around for the questions at the end. But I'm going to move us straight on. And we've already, well, we're all here in this chat room because of COVID. Um, David Dickey has already mentioned increasing concerns about the impact of COVID. But of course, COVID has had an impact on air pollution as well. And Felix Leach, our next speaker at the Department of Engineering, has been working with the Ox Area Project to come up with some really interesting information. So, Felix, take it away. Great, thank you very much, Chris. Um, just to check, can everyone see, see my slides okay? Great. So yeah, my name's Felix Leach. I'm an associate professor uh, in engineering here at Oxford, and a lot of my work is on air pollution and air quality. And I want to tell you very briefly about the, um, the Oxaria project that uh, I've been conducting uh, in collaboration with Suzanne Bartington at the University of Birmingham, who will, who will be known to many of you. So the, the aim of, of what we want to do in, in Oxaria is uh, phase one was just to um, really gather background data about air pollution in Oxford. So uh, you'll see shortly that we've got uh, air pollution sensors installed all around Oxford. Um, 
And we want to obtain a baseline so that then we can measure the impact of what we call the public health measures in response to COVID. So these are things that either people are doing or most likely the council is doing in response to COVID. So for example, there was a great, for me as a scientist, natural experiment uh, in April when we all went into lockdown and traffic levels plummeted, et cetera, et cetera. But since then, there have been things like the pedestrianisation of um, George Street and St. Michael Street, lots of discussion about things like bus gates and so on, which you know, may or may not happen. But, but these are the types of interventions we're trying to capture uh, the impact of on air quality. Um, so phase one was the background collection that was funded by the National Institute for Health Research and Research England. That ran until July this year. And we were very fortunate with hindsight to have been able to have some sensors installed during lockdown. And I'll show you some of those results shortly. And we're now funded by the Natural Environment Research Council um, until December 2021. So we've got uh, about 18 months to really get into the nitty gritty of this. Um, so what we have are 18 uh, air pollution monitors. They're made by a company called South Coast Science. Um, eight of them measure four gases. So NO, NO2, ozone and carbon monoxide alongside particulate matter, and 10 of them uh, measure NO2 and particulates. When we went into COVID lockdown, obviously we were in the process of deploying our sensors as part of phase one. We had three functioning sensors up and running, um, and I'll show you where those were, but um, there was uh, one on Worcester College, um, one at the Plain Roundabout, uh, and one on Ship Street right in the centre of town. Uh, but they provided absolutely invaluable data and I'll show you some of that very shortly. But the whole focus of this project, because we're responding to things that are completely outside of our control, COVID lockdowns, um, public health responses and so on, we're being very adaptable to, uh, to these situations and, and keeping things going. So I'm sure many of you will want to know where are the sensors? So uh, this is uh, where we're deploying. We've got 16 deployed um, and two sort of hot spares, just in case things go wrong with any of them. And we've selected these locations in consultation with the councils, councillors, other stakeholders in Oxford. Um, but the aim is to try and capture as many of these um, interventions as possible. So whether that be a bus gate or, or whatever. And so you'll see that some of the locations are around where a bus gate proposal might be. So just to give you a flavour of what we've seen, um, uh, Suzanne, my colleague at Birmingham, took these amazing photos of Oxford in the middle of lockdown. Uh, you may or may not recognise them, but streets that are normally absolutely heaving with cars were blissfully empty. You can see the Friedswald Square on the left and St Giles on the right. Um, and overall, we had about a 60% reduction in traffic in the city centre during lockdown. That was what our, the um, council census told us. And what does this lead to? So this is an example of some raw data that we can get. This is from a sensor on the Oxford High Street. Um, and each of these points represents either a gas or a particulate matter measurement um, uh, for a day and the little sort of uh, bars around the data display the variation through that day or the standard deviation through that day, I should strictly say. Mm. And you can see that um, for this particular sensor, we saw a big drop in NO that's emitted directly with vehicles during lockdown. And so you'd expect that. Um, but actually other, other pollutants, it's a bit, bit of more of a mixed picture. So we can then aggregate some of this data and display it more like this. So uh, we can say that at a roadside sensor, so for example, the high street, we saw about a 50% drop in NO2 during lockdown um, and about an 80% drop in NO during lockdown. But actually the background didn't change at all. And that's really important because in practice, that's the air that we spend most of the time breathing. Um, you know, of course, we breathe roadside air when we're out and about, but during lockdown, we were all at home. And I spend, you know, most of my time still at home because we were, we're in lockdown. So it's interesting that the NO2 background readings didn't really change. What I found most interesting was that the particulate matter readings actually increased during lockdown. And I think this is a, an area that we should spend some time thinking about because uh, particulates are not caused so much by uh, roadside traffic, although some of them are, of course, but they're also caused by things like wood burning stoves. And we know that these are particularly hazardous to human health. One could argue more so than NO2. So I think um, one of the things I'd like to, to bring to your attention is the fact that although some pollutants really did improve during lockdown, others, which are arguably um, more dangerous, actually got worse during lockdown. So 
I've briefly alluded to the fact that this project is aiming to capture some of these emergency transport measures. Here's a list of these, no doubt many of you are familiar with them. Um, it's a source of some frustration to me that not many of these, in fact, any of them really have been implemented. And I hope we can continue to advocate for, for these going forwards. Um, and we certainly stand ready to measure them. So what are we doing right now in phase two? We are measuring uh, pollution already with our deployed sensors. We're also introducing noise pollution monitoring. Um, that's going to be specifically targeted around low traffic neighborhoods. Um, but we're having to be adaptable and flexible because the public health situation is changing quite rapidly. But the main aim is to develop evidence to inform policymaking. So we're working with, with both councils, um, both the city and the county to help improve policymaking. If you want to find out more than this sort of uh, eight to 10 minute overview, please, please look at our website. Um, it's live, you can find out more about our sensors, where we've got them, what we plan to do with noise and so on. Uh, it, the link's just there, oxaria.org.uk, and I can put that in the chat when I finish speaking. Um, similarly, I just want to bring to your attention the Oxford Air Quality Meeting, which I launched for the first time last year. It's mostly research focused, but we do also have a session on policy in the community. Um, it's happening online on the 15th of January next year. Again, I'll put the link in the chat, but I know a number of you I recognize from attending the meeting last year. It's really valuable to have your contributions. Um, and it's, it really aims to bring together a lot of the kind of movers and shakers in, in this field, particularly in the academic sphere. I just want to finish by making some acknowledgements. So firstly, the Professor Martin Williams, who very sadly died two weeks ago, he was the chair of our steering group and did a lot for air quality, not only in Oxford, but around the whole world. So we miss him greatly and I, I must really acknowledge him, as well as all my uh, collaborators who are very much uh, driving this project forwards with me, Suzanne, Francis, Neil and Tony, um, the steering group more generally, and of course the people who pay the bills, NAHR Research England and the Natural Environment Research Council. So like I said, it's a really, really rapid overview, um, but thanks for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Otherwise, get in touch, email, Twitter, whatever, whatever works best for you. But thank you very much for, for listening. No, oh, some interesting points there. Um, anyone? Questions? You'll have to unmute yourself and wave your hand. Uh, yeah, Brenda Boardman. Thank you. Um, Felix, you didn't say enough about why you think particulates went up. Um, and as a lot of this was the summer, uh, I assume it's therefore not wood stoves. So you're, you're right, Brenda, and, and the, the honest answer is I don't have all of the answers in particular because I, I don't have the capability to capture the particles and do speciation on them. Um, the first part of lockdown, if you recall, was actually very cold. Um, you know, end of March, beginning of April, before we had that lovely weather in late April, early May, it was very cold. And um, just my sort of Mark One nose was telling me that there were wood burning stoves alive and kicking somewhere. Um, I think we also, because we had quite gentle southerly winds, we were importing particles from the continent. Again, there's not much we can do about that, but it's worth observing. Um, I, and of course, uh, April, May time is sort of peak agricultural spreading time. And uh, ammonia in particular from agricultural spreading also contributes to particulates. So you're right, I, I don't, didn't tell you that much more because I don't know that much more, but I could sort of make some guesses. It does seem like this is quite a fundamental issue because the City Council's <coughs> air quality plan out for consultation now that some people may have looked at has highlighted this fact that particulates, which we've always in the past tended to associate with transport, and transport is actually only a relatively small part of the particulate problem, especially at PM 2.5 level. That's right. I think in Oxford, <coughs> excuse me, it's about 11 percent of PM 2.5 is from transport, or from road transport. Yeah, and that, so the majority are coming and it can't just be wood burners. I mean, it must be central heating, gas cookers. Um, so gas releases very few particles when it's burnt because it's a gas. It's really burning okay. solid things and, and liquids to an extent that releases particles. So it's, it's burning solids, whether that's, you know, in industrial processes or, or in, in wood burners. But you'd be amazed at the level of domestic wood burners. Jake here, can I just make a quick comment? So obviously, the, most of the centres are in the city centre, away from sort of where most you know, domestic people live. Quite a lot of the Oxford colleges have uh, wood burning stoves. Certainly in um, Broad Street, I've noticed it from uh, some of the colleges there. 
you really know you can physically physically see the uh, sort of wood the wood burning smoke when it comes up it would be uh, really interesting to see which colleges are sort of um which do have open fires uh, or wood or etc just to, uh, to to correlate that and um, plot that to um and then have a discussion with them that's right jake and, and the pubs as well um a yes, of pubs point, yeah 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 okay um any more questions and i'll take questions for kayla as well if people have got questions for kayla oh no if no one has i'm going to leave those for the discussion because i'm quite relieved to see that tom hayes um, cabinet member for the city council has just joined us. Tom, Hi Chris. You there? Yeah, how are you? I'm very well. Um, we've been having a very interesting discussion and there's been a lot of activity going on around the county today um, to remind people about Clean Air Day. And we've just heard from Felix about what's going on in the city and from Lynn about the role of schools and Kayla's work on giving this a human face. But at the core of controlling air pollution is going to be policy and planning. So it's highly appropriate that we've got you here now to talk about the city's air quality action plan, which may well have lessons for the, a lot of the people in the audience tonight aren't from the city, but I think all the districts are gonna be looking at the city as well. So do you want to tell us a little bit about current thinking at the city? Absolutely. And first of all, I just want to apologise for coming in literally at the start point. Um, I know that some people who are actually in this meeting are in other meetings that I'm in elsewhere. <laughs> They're kind of double meeting, as it were. So I'm afraid after, after speaking, I'm going to have to dip back into my residence association um, to talk about students returning and the, the risk of infection from coronavirus. Um, so I, it's great to be here. It's great to, to have Clean Air Day actually happening this year. We thought earlier in the year that it may not happen, such was the pandemic. Um, but I think it's really important that we do mark this day. It's important that we draw attention uh, as much as possible to the health impacts that can arise from air pollution, but also the other impacts that can arise. So just this week, we've seen really compelling evidence coming from the University of Manchester, which links air pollution with educational ability. Uh, the poorer the air quality, the more damage that it could do to people's educational ability at a younger age. And when we have children and young people who in recent months have been kept away from their education in schools, the last thing that we need is for them to be having this situation compounded by air pollution at their school gates, which is causing their educational ability to be more limited. And we've, of course, got the established links between air pollution and other kinds of health conditions such that younger people and older people and people with pre-existing health conditions will be disproportionately affected by air pollution and will as a result have earlier mortality rates. So clearly there's a, there's a health, there's an educational, and there's a wider social justice reason for taking action to combat, climate, uh, to combat air pollution. And the City Council has over the last 10 or so years been really dedicated with partners and civil society campaigners, including Friends of the Earth, to addressing air pollution. And we've had some success. We've seen a 26% reduction in air pollution since 2013. We've seen the introduction of transportation measures which have played a large part in reducing the air pollution that we have experienced in the city. And we know in Oxford that the particular layout of the city makes it harder to have significant impacts in reducing air pollution. We're a medieval city, we've got very narrow streets into which we pile vehicles, uh, which often belch out emissions which can cause air pollution to cluster and concentrate in fixed locations. And so we really do need to double down and go further. Since 2017, we've seen a plateauing of the air pollution levels after um, consecutive years of reductions. And I think uh, the recent air quality annual status reports have shown that if we want to make in any progress, we need to go further, we need to go faster. And that really is the basis for the new air quality action plan. For years, we've been calling on government to go further we've asked them to just really get to grips with air pollution. And three different times, they've been taken to court by client Earth and they have lost court cases around their monitoring of air pollution and the action that they need to take and the support that they give to local councils. And we just got sick and tired of waiting for Whitehall to do something. We can't wait for ministers to drag their feet and in so doing to put people's lives at risk. 
And so we're proposing with our air quality action plan to go further than the government's own target uh, for reducing air pollution, further than their legal annual mean target of 40 micrograms. We're proposing that it be 30 micrograms, pardon me, micrograms um, by 2025, that that be the target that we seek to meet. And we realize it's a big, bold statement. It's a statement of intent. It's about flagging to the government that local government isn't going to wait for them to come up with the solutions. We can't just wait uh, for the cavalry to come. But it's also a way for us to galvanize action in the city. And so as part of the action plan, we've set out four distinct areas of action that we want to take, 30 actions in total. The first is to develop the partnerships and public education. We will be taking that forward with the work that we do with schools around the city. Just recently, we have held a contest with Friends of the Earth for school children to design air pollution banners, to have banners which indicate to their parents and guardians that they want to have fewer vehicles pulling up outside of their school gates. And if the, if the cars are going to go up to the school gates, that they cut the engine, that they don't idle. And that contest has been a really successful one. It was a pleasure to be a judge on that and to see some of the fantastic contributions that were made by our young people. And the design is wonderful. It's now hanging at Woodmill Primary School as a banner. And it's also now hanging at East Oxford Primary School in my ward. Um, so I went down to have a little peek earlier and it's looking absolutely fantastic. Directly facing Union Street car park. It feels a very appropriate place for it to be facing. Uh, we're also wanting to continue our citywide events and accelerate our events which particularly promote communications around just transition. We're really pleased to see Oxair building an evidence base and working so well in the city. And the City Council has linked up before with Oxair significantly and intends to continue to do that. We want to continue, our improve, um, to, continue to improve our air quality uh, communications, drawing on the lessons from the Citizens Assembly about how we dress climate breakdown and recognizing that a disproportionate amount of the changes that need to happen to impact on our carbon footprint will need to come from individuals and the changes in their behavior. We're really looking to produce some communications which are drawing on the latest insights about how to reach communities that typically aren't engaged with the climate agenda and typically aren't engaged with the air pollution agenda. And these often seem to have an overlap with communities that tend to be disproportionately affected by air pollution. And we want to go on using the forum that we set up, which brings together district councils, such as our own, and the county council uh, into discussion about air pollution and environmental change. We're hoping to bring together a set of principles which will be agreed by the growth board and as a consequence will be a basis for decision making by the districts and the county councils, a new narrative, a new mindset, potentially a new policy uh, framework for the districts and the county to join our own efforts. A second area of activity that we're taking forward is the support that we're giving to the uptake of low emission vehicles and zero emission vehicles. We've seen 2.3 million pounds come into the city to retrofit 115 buses to a Euro 6 standard. We've seen the first electric buses on our roads. And we are also going to be seeing the introduction of the ultra low emission zone, which will regulate buses to that Euro 6 standard as part of the wider zero emission zone, which is restricting polluting vehicles from coming into the city center and sets really tight uh, emission standards for our Hackney cabs to reach zero emissions by 2025. We're progressing work in the zero emission zone with the County Council. Uh, there's a lot of meetings going on at the moment and we'll be announcing the next step on that in October. And our intent is to move as quickly as possible with that. We had to postpone it because it was right that we wouldn't put citizens and businesses through the process of consultation at the very point that the country was being locked down but we want to get back and up and running with that as quickly as possible. We've seen a huge reduction in traffic over the months of the lockdown, which led to a 59% drop in air pollution. And we want to build in those gains. We want to, as much as possible, clean up our air. We've also been developing the work on connecting Oxford with the County Council, which is the introduction of the combination of uh, the bus gates across the city and the workplace parking levy. The parking levy intended to subsidize public transport, the new orbital bus route so that we can encourage more people out of their cars and onto public transport. And that is developing uh, at some significant pace now. We're also working with the Project Energy Super Hub, which is intended not just to achieve uh, reductions in bills for energy for some of our poorer people in the city through the installation of heat pumps, which can be controlled by smart uh, technology and smartphones, but also through the installation of electric vehicle charging points in significant numbers, particularly in the west of the city, 
and also introducing the capacity for the city council to accelerate the electrification of its own fleet, such that 25% of our fleet will be electrified by 2030. By the end of this year, we should have taken receipt of 90 electric or ultra low emission vehicles. And that has all been made possible and facilitated by the Energy Super Hub Oxford project, a 40 million pound investment, which has been significantly, uh, significantly brought in by private sector money, showing that if you build a sense of Oxford as a place where real change can happen, a place where if you pull on levers, you can see change happen in a really short space of time, that you can bring in investment. And we know that needs to happen because the years and years and years of underfunded by government, or let's just call it what it is, cuts, have meant that the city council's in a perilous financial position because of COVID and the need to respond to it. The third area of activity that we'll be drawing, taking forward is the reduction of emissions from domestic heating and buildings. And as part of this, we've already got a process underway to assess our own uh, energy efficiency in our council stock. That piece of work is carrying on and next set to conclude soon. And we're carrying on the plans for the assessment of housing stock uh, and its energy efficiency. And we're obviously encouraging the development in Oxford of heat networks. And then lastly, the fourth area of activity is the reduction for the need to travel, the exploration of opportunities for modal shift, and frankly, the embrace of the new normal. I don't think that all of us will want to go to five days a week working from home when a vaccine is developed. I think we're all missing each other. It feels very weird to be staring into a screen and seeing you all. Uh, I'd much rather be with you. But it is clear that some of the virtual working that we're already trialing as a response to the emergency will become part of the new normal. And that will have impact on the kinds of spaces that we need and use in the city centre, the kind of travel that we take within the city, um, and frankly, the kind of economy that we're building. It also means really thinking through how we disincentivize people to use their fossil fuel cars and to hop onto buses or sustainable travel. We absolutely need to be encouraging the cycle networks that are segregated, linking park and rides to the city centre through arterial roads, the prioritisation of uh, bus priority lanes and the introduction and rollout to a greater extent of CPZs. And I'll close just by saying this. We've seen in this city over recent months a very heated debate about bus gates and the introduction of temporary city centre bus gates. I think you all know where I stand. You all know where the city council stands. We've made our points extremely clear. And we're, going into, we're coming to a fork in the road with the county council. The county council having backed bus gates at the first hurdle and now dropping their support for bus gates. That seems clear from the officer report and the likely feeling of county cabinet members that I speak to. That should raise alarm bells. We won the consultation if you treat the consultation as a referendum. I don't think we ought to, but if you look at the consultation responses for people living inside the city and living outside the city and the total number of respondents, it was a win in favour of bus gates and the vision that we tried to paint as a city council of cleaner air, of fewer roads, of fewer vehicles on our roads, the possibility of backing buses and the ways that we need to tackle our climate emergency. I think the key lessons here are quite significant. First of all, we won the debate, but we lack political will in the County Council to make change happen. So what brings that political will forward? Second of all, we won the debate, but we didn't win it decisively. Quite understandably, there are people who didn't have the answers they needed from the County Council about how a workable scheme could be practical and make them feel like they could achieve their overall vision, but not so discomfort them during a time of pandemic and unprecedented change that they would feel extremely discomforted. And I think the third lesson is that civil society campaigning can work. The, I, I saw significant mobilization of people from organizations like Extinction Rebellion, Cyclox and Greenpeace and other organizations in the city. And I think if we really want to make change happen in the city, we need to think about how we do that, how we bring all of our organizations together in a campaigning infrastructure because I feel sure that had civil society done an even better job of campaigning, and I think there were areas for improvement, we could absolutely have seen a better result in the consultation responses. And we might not now be having the county council bottling it and backing out of their bus gates commitment. And I think that's particularly important because we're heading into an even greater period of change around the proposed East Oxford bus gates, the zero emission zone and connecting Oxford, when very clearly at the county level, there is a, dimin there is a diminishing of appetite for real change. So I'll leave it there. I want to throw out that challenge at the end because I think there's a lot to play for. I think there's a big vision to realize, 
And I think it's a window of opportunity that we all need to seize. And I'm looking forward to, to seizing that opportunity with all of you. Thanks, Chris. Okay, well, thank you, Tom. Have you got time for two questions? Uh, I do, yes. What time is it? It's about two minutes to. Any, any, okay. Anyone, one or two questions? Anyone? I'm looking for hands up or just speak up. Kayla. Um, Tom, you mentioned that you are um, interested in connecting with those um, folks across the city who don't normally take part in conversations about air pollution because they perhaps don't have the, the bandwidth or space to connect with them, um, to, to, to engage. Um, and they also might be the most, um, the most affected. I'm curious if you can be a little bit more specific about that um, and those plans and how you're going about that. I think you'll be aware of who the communities are because they're the very communities that you're focusing your action upon too. They tend to be people from the poorer areas of the city, the more working class communities, the BAMA populations in the city, the older populations that really struggle to have enough income to heat their homes and to support their general needs. Um, and all of these people, for various reasons, may not be able to access this conversation. It may be a question of internet connectivity and comfort with online activity. It may be a question of um, English being the first language. It may be a question of people just trying to get through a pandemic and not being able to focus down on the wider questions. And that's why with our, air, with our Clean Air Day communications, we've gone absolutely to town in trying to draw a link between coronavirus and air pollution. Because if we're trying to get people's attention, what works? Maybe the frame of coronavirus, which is very pop, which is very um, current, which is very compelling, is the way to do that. And it's also very evidence-based. In terms of the ways in which we wish to do this, I think it's about looking at a host of online and offline events in this new world. We'd originally been working up plans to do mostly offline. There was a clear steer from the Citizens Assembly that online was, was somehow exclusionary, um, that it wasn't particularly helpful for reaching all the right communities that we want to reach. And so we're now thinking through, how do you actually, in a time of pandemic and social distancing, reach people when the thing most preoccupying them is an air pollution? Um, There'll be a youth climate summit, which is due to happen in the next few months. We're accelerating work on that. And we want to bring into that a distinct focus on the uh, climate wrecking impact um, of emissions and also the air polluting impacts of emissions. And we also want to rethink how we allocate our community grants such that we can reach communities that are typically underrepresented in receiving grants, but may also be up for meeting some of our new criteria around environmental action. And I think the last thing I'll say, and this is not something which I think my council officers will be particularly pleased with me throwing out here because it's a desire which hasn't yet been fully resourced. But I'm really conscious that there's a lot of money coming through grant making bodies for climate action. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a real need for the city council to be linking up with civil society groups, particularly those with uh, lived experience of being within these communities to bid for that money and come up with some really innovative um, examples that we can make successful and then scale up across the city. Okay, thanks, Tom. I know you've got to go, and I'm also aware that we said we would be moving on to our next speaker at seven o'clock, which it is now. So I'm going to say thank you to Tom. Um, Tom is, of course, always available for questions. I'm sure people email him. So I'm going to move on to our final speaker. And thanks, Tom. To take thanks. over. Jackie. Right. Um, yes, our final speaker. We're very privileged this evening to have Jenny Bates with us. Um, Jenny Bates is the national campaigner for clean air for um, Friends of the Earth. That's Friends of the Earth nationally. And um, it's uh, very, very good for us to have Jenny with us today on this important clean air day. So welcome, Jenny. Thank you, and I can hear you, and I just don't know how well you can hear me, and maybe you can only hear me through my laptop, so can you hear me adequately now or not? Yes. yes. Good. Yeah. Great, okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to get my tech people uh, tomorrow to try and sort my headphones out. Um, I'm really going to talk about some things you can do, some solutions, but just a couple of sort of points about things that have been going on recently. 
I think you're aware that there's a young lady in London who uh, died sadly after um, breathing bad air on the South Circular, um, and her name is Ella. And if uh, she's having her the inquest into her death reopened, and if if that gets um, uh, through, that would be the first time that air pollution would actually be on a death certificate, because that's the strange thing with air pollution. Although it's so much more immediate uh, than climate change, it's, it, in a way, it's although it's invisible, it's actually sort of more visible in some ways. But still, even then, um, all the sort of deaths, the early deaths up to thirty-six thousand, actually, you know, uh, air pollution isn't mentioned on death certificates. So. That's something that would, could change things for, for everyone and, and, and make it more uh, easier for people to communicate these things. Because, you know, something like a heart attack can be triggered by short-term air pollution and, and yet the death certificate would just say heart attack. Um, we've talked about the links with COVID and as I understand it, it looks like there are both long-term impacts from, you know, extended exposure to bad air but also possibly from where somebody is at a given moment. If the air is bad, it could actually change some of the cells in the lungs and make it easier for the virus to get in. So there's all sorts of things that are being looked at. Um, and just an update um, on, on where we are, like on uh, the NO2, uh, the latest uh, information from DEFRA is now that of the UK's 43 air quality zones, um, no, there were uh, previously 36 still failing, and now the recent figures are 33. Uh, so that's still three quarters of the zones are failing for a standard that we should have met in 2010, 10 years ago, or 2015 at the very latest if we'd got an extension. Um, and some data crunching that Friends of the Earth did looking at the local authorities' objective for NO2, which is set at the same standard as the legal standard the government has to meet, um, uh, uh, the objective for that in what they call the annual status reports, which have been mentioned earlier, uh, we found more than a thousand across England uh, places that, that were breaching um, the, the, the 40 microgram. So all of that shows why it's a really interesting uh, thing that Oxford is doing, going for the, the 30 standard. Um, certainly the World Health Organization has found health effects below the 40 standard and below the, their short-term standard of 200 micrograms. Um, so it's a, we don't know what the World Health Organization is going to say for their revised standard, but going for 30 is a really good sort of um, marker um, and ambition. Um, uh, all I would say is that um, I think whatever you do, you mustn't delay getting to at least 40 as soon as possible. Even if you've got the longer term uh, 30 standard for 2025, don't delay getting at least to 40 as quickly as possible. Um, on particulates, we've, we've discussed quite a lot. Um, and, and again, uh, the big difference here is that the UK standards differ from the World Health Organization standards. Um, the UK and the EU differ from the World Health Organization standards. And that comes to uh, me to the, the first really big thing that's absolutely crucial at the moment in terms of pressure that is needed. We need to get the World Health Organization standards as those that the UK use it now in the post-Brexit world. And there's an opportunity in the Environment Bill to do that. The government has been talking about WHO standards for PM 2.5s. Um, uh, and the WHO say 2030, that date had been sort of missed off in the sort of early sort of musings on this. And now even the, the WHO standard at all as a, as a standard for PM 2.5 is, is not uh, in the Environment Bill. So there's lots to do. The British Lung Foundation, who is a partner in something called the Healthy Air Campaign, which is a coalition of um, health charities, environmental ones like ourselves, we were founding members in 2011, and uh, transport charities. Um, British Lung Foundation have got an action to urge you to try and get your MP to support that in the Environment Bill. Um, and uh, we, we refer to it in terms of the air stuff, although we, we, you know, we, we mainly defer to the Healthy Air Campaign position that we're signed up to. Um, so uh, I think um, you know, the, the WHO standard is, is actually, you know, although the UK meets more or less meets its current UK and EU standards, 
the whole of London fails the, the WHA standard and many, many places around, around the country, towns and cities. And the British Lung Foundation again showed that a lot of medical establishments and educational establishments are in places where WHA standards is, is failing. Um, so I think overall, in terms of action, we, we have got to try and think of all sources, tackling all sources of all the key pollutants. Um, and I've talked about the Environment Bill, um, and I can post the link to the sort of briefing that uh, we're signed up to the Healthy Air Campaign. And the, the key ask is this one about getting the WHO standards in place. But there are others that support that as, as well. You know, things that like there, there needs to be a short term target for PM 2.5. The standards need to come in sooner. We need a duty on all public bodies to actually actively work towards meeting those standards. So there's a, a suite of asks on the Environment Bill with the, 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 the WHA PM 2.5 standard as the key. Um, and then on sort of transport, which we're talking about, because that is the main source of NO2, 80% of the NO2 at the roadside of which, in, interestingly, th the single biggest contributor to roadside uh, NO2 is diesel cars. Um, so that's a, a key issue. So we don't leave the cars out. Um, and as we've discussed, um, although PM's uh, particulate matter is more of a mix of sources, road traffic is still a key one. And it's all vehicles, it's all road vehicles. So even electric vehicles, uh, zero exhaust are still producing particles from broken tire wear and abrasion on the roads. Um, so on transport, it, it's still a key sector. It is still the, 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 sort of the biggest problem. And also it's the single biggest uh, sector for carbon dioxide emissions in our uh, economy. So, you know, anything we can do should be doing win-win solutions for climate and for, and for air. So overall, we need both cleaner vehicles and we need fewer of them. And it really does need both. Um, we do need that space out of internal combustion engine, uh, diesel car, diesel uh, and uh, petrol cars and vans by 2030 instead of 2040, which is what the government have been saying. We need things like the clean air zones or the ULEZs or the zero emission zones and make sure that they cover as wide an area as possible. Um, and then it is, in terms of reducing um, uh, vehicles, um, for climate reasons, we research we've done, had done for us, shows that we need at least a 20% cut in car miles by 2030 to meet our Paris climate targets. Um, and, you know, something like you know, the, the, the big problems you've got, uh, the, you know, the city centre is one thing, but you've got problems on some of the big roads around your county and, I know outside Oxford, the A34 is a problem. So we have to get the background levels of traffic down. Um, but we also need to make it easy. The whole thing with solutions, it has to be made easy for people to do the right thing without it being a problem. So, you know, we need to have things, the government should be leading on a strappage scheme, for instance, um, that sort of thing, uh, with the mobility credits. So, you, you know, you get a better incentive if you switch, not just to get a, a new clean car, but you get a car club membership or rail season ticket or a loan to get a, an electric bike, that sort of thing. Um, and um, so, and then, you know, in terms of further restrictions beyond the clean air zones as well, you've got the school streets we've been talking about, absolutely brilliant, win, win, win. Uh, and, and it's so, so interesting to hear uh, from the head teacher about how the kids can be such a catalyst. And we've already talked about making some of the temporary COVID measures permanent, which is really important. And about planning, reducing the need to travel is so important. Um, so overall road space needs to be reallocated more to the good things. And I think something that is very hard for people to understand is that traffic is not all displaced. It's very um, well understood by DFT and others that traffic evaporates if you have alternatives in place. Um, not everything gets shoved onto other roads, but you do have to make sure that you design schemes that you do look at what would happen on the main roads or include main roads and we have measures also on main roads because it is the, the, the most disadvantaged who tend to live on those main roads. So they need to be put in with care. Um, but traffic does evaporate. Um, and then the other big thing is just don't add to the problem. You know, in the traffic generating schemes, whether it's um, car dependent housing, large uh, 
sort of supermarket car parks or um, certainly, you know, new road building, like the government's got a £27 billion roads programme and they're sort of allocating £2 billion only to sort of walking and cycling. So, you know, it's that sort of money that, from the roads programme that, that needs to go to other things. And the public are behind this. Actually, um, fewer than one in seven want money to be spent on new and bigger roads, whereas more than a third want money to be spent on um, buses and, and cycling. Um, because uh, the problem is that just as traffic evaporates when you take away road space, traffic is generated, new traffic is generated when you, when you build uh, uh, more road space. So um, there are lots of things you can do. As I mentioned, the British Lung Foundation on the Environment Bill, we've had a, uh, a petition about a green and fair recovery, which includes stuff on transport and air pollution and WHA standards. We just handed in our sort of petition, but it, it still seems to be on our website, so it may be that you could still use that. Um, also, just sort of um, get, get involved with Friends of the Earth locally, um, take climate action, we've got a lot of resources, our sort of separate uh, aligned website, climate action groups, and there are ready-made partners um, with the Healthy Air campaign. You've got something like the British Lung Foundation, British Heart Foundation, Asthma UK, all of those cancer research, they're all partners in the Healthy Air campaign. Um, and there's also Client Earth working with, I think it's British Lung Foundation, on a Clean Air Parents Network. So that might be of interest to some of you with the schools. So that's a quick rundown through a few, um, a few sort of things that, that can be done. But basically, yes, it just keep, keep talking about it, keep mentioning it. Um, I think we can have so much uh, synergy with climate, uh, with win-win solutions uh, in, that, in that respect. So I think uh, there is getting more and more awareness and, and brilliant all the work you're all doing. Well, thank you, Jenny. Um, we've got 15 minutes and we'll do some questions first for Jenny or for any, any of the other part, any of the speakers who are still with us. Anyone? want anything further from Jenny or got questions or points to make? Do you speak up? Chris, if, if I may, um, mm -hmm. greetings from New Zealand. It's uh, really interesting to see what's happening back in Oxford and to hear Tom um, explain how the County Council yet again is going back on sort of its mandates and um, it's push for uh, more green transport options. I mean, I follow what is being done on the Botley Road, uh, allegedly for uh, bus priority, um, but there's no indication that um, Stagecoach uh, is using electric buses on the S1 service. Um, £9.1 million pounds being spent on, on Botley Road, and yet they're not... Uh, or they're backtracking now, trying hard to backtrack on the bus gates. Um, very little is going to improve walking along the Botley Road. Um, there is the facilities between cyclists and pedestrians are being crushed. Um, this is not a good move for um, air quality along uh, that corridor. I know it's one that you're familiar with and particularly with the local primary school there. Um, I'm, I'm just slightly amazed that they were successful in getting just 56% of the funding for the A40 um, dual carriaging. Um, I'm really concerned that when uh, Ensham Garden Village is, is built, it is built primarily um, for um, car travel uh, between there and the rest of the county. Um, I'm just at a bit of a loss. Um, has anyone got any other observations on how the county says one thing and then does exactly the opposite? I think there'd be quite a few people here who might have some observation on that. I think the key point I will make is that this autumn we're going to have the next round of consultation 
on the county's new transport plan. And the last county's transport plan talked a lot about air pollution and a lot about reducing emissions, but we didn't get a lot of action. This time, I think we really do need to be stronger. And I think Tom's point about the different groups needing to work together isn't just a matter of the climate groups in the county, it's a matter of groups in the city. It is a matter of groups right across the county, as you say. Um, I hope we haven't spent too much time on the city today. Let me ask, is there anyone from outside the city who wants to come in on this? Just for a minute. I know we've got a lot of people active in different towns and villages. All got specific questions for Jenny. Hey, uh, I've got a question. <laughs> Hi there, Chris. Yeah. Yes, well, I have several questions, but I'll just put one to anybody, really. I've noticed the buses traveling from Kidlington to Oxford to work here in Oxford. I'm in my office now, and I live in Kidlington. And I've, all, I've noticed for a long time that summer towns are bottleneck because the road narrows. Um, and I'm just wondering what people's thoughts are on the air quality implications of that bottleneck. Does anybody have any thoughts? I mean, the bus lane disappears through the shopping mall at Summertown. Um, it just strikes me as bizarre that we have uh, bus lanes on either side of Summertown, but then everything grinds to halt. Uh, and you have a lot of idling on, along that stretch. That's my question to everybody, really. <laughs> Thanks. It's a general question. One of the yeah. points is about how far we want to limit traffic and how far we want to keep it moving. Felix, yes. I believe you were doing a lot of work on kind of what happens with stop-start traffic. Yeah, that's right, Chris. So I, I, I wouldn't necessarily want to comment exactly on what Igor was just uh, mentioning simply because I haven't done the, the work in that area. But I think anything you can do to keep traffic moving, and in practice what that means is taking cars off the road and allowing the buses to keep moving, um, because it's not like we can demolish all those shops in Summertown or whatever to, to make the road wider. And indeed, all the evidence shows that if we make the road wider, all that happens is you fill it up with more cars until ordering stops again. Um, we need to think about ways. I think this is where the, the county's bus gate proposals could have been so valuable, yet they seem to be in the process of abandoning them, uh, to, to find ways to persuade cars not to drive in, at which point then the buses can travel freely through because we want people to use the buses. We want people to cycle if they can and if they're able to. But until we can uh, prevent the cars, I think that's that's the only way. And, and he goes, right, there are, of course, air quality implications. Yeah, OK. Um, so can I just suggest, unless anyone got any specific questions for Jenny? Gillian? Yes, um, I was just going to mention the Botley Road, uh, the, uh, sorry, the Abingdon Road between Redbridge and, um, well, say, the police station. Um, I've often seen families walking along um, beside a, just a static row of cars and, you know, breathing in goodness knows what from all these idling vehicles. And I don't know, you know, whether that is something else that could be emphasised. Well, I think the question, I mean, one of the questions for me is, um, what are we actually we, the target for tonight was what can we do? And what I'd like to kind of maybe just share one screen, um, if I can. Uh, no, it's, um, there's a point really that we have the issue of policy work, which is what Jenny has been talking about, but practical action about making it safer to walk and cycle and of which the low traffic neighborhoods cycling and so on is critical and also a little bit about the whoops, behavior change the question i think is how do we as as a network of groups as friends of the earth and other groups across the county actually where should we be putting our efforts i mentioned the fact that we have the County Council's transport plan coming up. We have the zero emission zone as an opportunity, but we know we need to do an awful lot of work on awareness. And Lynn has mentioned the 
you know, the need to really engage through schools and other community organisations. Where do people, if we were going to make this, the next, let me just say, the, suggest, the next start, the next phase of campaigning on this, it's three years since Frontier have launched the Clean Air Charter. What do we actually want to do in this next phase to really get some real genuine change? Do we want to be really pushing the modal shift, getting people out of their cars? Do we really, should we be focusing simply on the national policies? And how far do we actually really want to get more and more people engaged and aware? Is it all of those? Um, Gillian. Yeah, I was going to say that one of the reasons for the, for the jam on that particular road is because everybody's queuing up to go to John Lewis. And I wondered whether, as another place to put pressure, we could try and persuade John Lewis to have some sort of shuttle bus or something that would persuade people, you know, maybe a, an okay. incentive. Well, so almost a commercial park and ride. Yeah. Jenny, I think you want to come back on this. I mean, on the summer side, I didn't mean to cut Gillian off there. That sounds I'd interesting. Finish. Yeah, sort of. Uh, Can you London, speak closer to your laptop? Yeah, sorry. There's, there's great examples in London of businesses getting together. There's something like the West, the new West End companies, sort of all the businesses in Regent Street got together, certainly for their own deliveries and supplies. But, but uh, and of course, businesses benefit when you have um, sort of pedestrianised areas or sort of traffic free, free areas. So, you know, those are two things. And I'm thinking about summertime. I, I do know Oxford a bit, and I, uh, I couldn't remember that it narrows there. But uh, another thing is to narrow the road uh, earlier, before summertime, so that, you know, the, the pinch point isn't in summertime itself. Maybe narrow it back um, to where there are people there, or, you know, so you're dispersing the um, impact more. And again, I don't know what your situation is with long distance cycleways, but that's a key thing that Europe are good on doing. They actually, you know, it's not just in the city. They actually got sort of city to city. I think the Copenhagen area cycle paths uh, go for miles, miles and miles and miles, sort of, you know, into city. So I don't know whether there's more that could be, you know, at a county level, you could do more to push for, for longer distance cycling, uh, separated, segregated facilities. I mean, there are, we have got a very substantial cycle lobby in and around Oxford and COSAT, the Coalition for Healthy Streets and Active Transport, of which Friends EF is a member, have been pursuing that. Um, I mean, I think the, the sense of frustration that I see in some people that we've had all these ideas coming out from the county, the emergency travel funding and so on but we don't seem to be getting any significant progress. Um, I don't know what other people feel, how far, where we should be going on this. Brenda? Well, what I was going to suggest, I think it would be really good if we could work up two or three totally important principles, um, because we've got the May election coming up for the county councillors, uh, and it would be very good if we knew what we were really worried about and focused in our questions to the various candidates or possible candidates um, as to what it is we wanted. Um, um, I mean, and, and I just wanted to check, Chris, that I heard Tom Hayes correctly, or anybody else, did he actually say that with the Busgates debate, although across the county there is a majority against Busgates, Within the city, there is a majority in favour of the bus gates. Is that what he meant? Well, I, I don't yes. know if anyone else wants to come in on that. Certainly, I think he was fairly clear that the majority of responses right across, I think, had been in favour of the bus gates. No, I don't think so. Well, okay. I, it, must have, it must depend on how you count them. You know, when COSAC puts in a response and we've got 2,000 members, does that count as one or as 2,000? Um, uh, but the, the Oxford Times is saying that the, the actual count is in favour of no bus gates. But I'd heard that in the city, there was a fa in favour of busking. Well, certainly that's what Tom said. Yes. Yeah. So 
any other what what would people like to see happen out we there are a few points which we are which we cannot ignore the city's transport plan the county transport plan the zero emission zone the low traffic neighborhoods the school streets are all coming unless this is very 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 significant back backs back peddling and brenda's raised the point that the county is the transport authority is coming up for elections next may they will be discussing the can the transport plan before that but are that what how can we tackle this we've heard new points tonight about the, the links between covid and air pollution the issue of particulates is starting to widen the air pollution debate from simply transport but it, how far is this how far do we want to focus on transport or do we want to look wider and there's a bottom line here about whether we should be looking to take the county the city's target of saying the city is going to aim for a much lower nitrogen dioxide target nitrogen oxide target and should we as groups working together be saying well let's as Boris would say level up or in this case, level down and aim for that target right across the county. Because of course, many rural parts of the county are well below it already. But what we've seen today is people concerned in a number, number of towns. Is there an appetite for some kind of county-wide push on this? I think, Chris, one of the things that uh, we may want to focus on is the really poor value that we get from um, the county highways. They have a budget of £600,000 a week. And I don't think many people in Oxford are seeing a very good return on that investment. Um, I note what uh, Henley Residents Association have been able to achieve by standing in the county elections um, and I think uh, much could be learned from them as well. All right, any other points? Um, I mean we we have got, I think there's a growing understanding of where we are and the, the but there seems to me a need to really focus in and think okay We've got a scattering of people right across the county. We've got some really excellent evidence base from Oxair, Oxaria, and you know, all the other monitoring that's being done in the city. And it's not going to be an issue that goes away. The question I've, I would finish is saying, how do we really take this from being something that a small group of people are very concerned about and the rest of the public is slightly worried about to something that would really be an issue at the election and beyond are what are the ways in which we could cooperate to really move this forward it may be no one has any answers tonight but i think this is where we need to look can i chip in jake here yeah. um Climate change is obviously remote, distant, we're not moving fast enough and decisively enough, but it seems to me air quality is something which hits home to people in their own local environment, and particularly uh, with young people and, uh, and old and infirm people, but particularly young people. And I've, in doing the sort of Oxair study, I, we've re really um, heartened by the concern and the power and the strong voice of parents concerned about the health of their children and i'm just i'm so depressed about the inability of our systems and our polit politicians to actually take any decisive action whether at the county level or the city level you know good intentions and good strategies just come up to nothing but faced with, and there was, we, there was some parents who uh, um, had children at the local school by the ring road outside Botley. And then I realized the power of these 
parents' voices, you know, the mums and the dads who are concerned about their children can hardly, um, you know, a politician would be, would struggle to resist that because facts, you know, we need facts because ultimately things like Busgate, you know, didn't happen because maybe we lacked a few facts or whatever, but ultimately the emotional power of concerned parents, I feel, can really drive change. So the more evidence we can get from studies like Oxaria or Oxair and others to give people the ammunition to actually take some action on this, I feel that we, we could, if we could focus around Friends of the Earth and the action that Friends of the Earth takes around schools, supplied with additional uh, you know, collateral or, or research data to say this is now unacceptable. We can now prove the harm that, um, that is caused by traffic. And so the one journey that can be avoided, you really can't do a lot about the ring road, but the one journey that can be avoided is very short distance travel to schools. It's unnecessary and there are lots of other alternatives. And then, you know, the unnecessary driving into Oxford. So for me, the, the whole thing that you're doing here and Friends of the Earth are doing around air quality, I feel is a really strong, strong action and we shouldn't give up and we should continue. Thank you, Jake. Jackie, you've been leading work on trying to get schools involved in this. Anything you want to come back on here? Um, uh, well, we have found that schools are so preoccupied with all the other things they have to do, it's quite difficult to get them engaged. But I'm very inspired by uh, many of the things which have been said this evening. And the, there's lots of new evidence coming in from studies by Felix and um, so on. Um, so I think, um, and what Jake has just said as well, I think we really do need to make a bigger effort on getting schools engaged. Lynn's um, talk was very inspirational on that. And if she can um, engage with some other school groups, I think that would be brilliant. Um, so yes, I feel inspired to take the school's work further, although we all know it isn't very easy. <coughs> Lynn, anything you want to come back on there? Only that, I mean, as Jackie said, you know, I, you know, I think we can put pressure on schools in, in the right way. I think some people just don't know quite how to go about getting it there. And I think the more we can support people with actual strategies to help them know how to organise their curriculum maybe differently or to look for other areas in which they can engage children, be it through an eco-schools committee, which doesn't have to happen in the school day as such, which is where we started. You know, it's we've, the children we know are passionate about it and let's use their power to move things on would be my suggestion. And I think the education has to start with our young people because they have got the opportunity, if you like, to make a difference. Okay, I think certainly there's the need for us is to look and maybe talk with yourself and others about going back to the county, not just on transport, but also on the county as the education authority. Yeah, and, and I think children can actually actively move that on themselves. And I think if okay. they can be involved in real life processes and see that there is an impact in what they do, and it's not just writing for writing's sake, but there is going to be a, a clear focus for who they're writing to, why they're writing to them, A, educationally it's you get the most powerful writing out of children but the impact on adults when children engage and put pressure on them is often much more influential than when another adult decides to do the same thing and i've seen that happen on lots of times and you know, we will get children to write letters to people if we want something you know a favor done because they are more likely to engage with those children okay well, look, it's after half seven. We said we'd run till then. We've overrun by seven minutes now, and I'm sure some of you have got supper waiting. Um, I will draw your attention to a lot of the fact stuff in the chat box. Um, and it, if anyone wants the links from the chat box, I would urge you to just, you can easily highlight it all and copy it. One of the points that Jenny has made is that the environment bill is still going through government processes and that the British Lung Foundation are pushing for higher particulate standards. 
should we, Jenny, are you suggesting we should be actively lobbying on this? Just one final point, the Environment Bill. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's the biggest thing that would make a difference. Um, if we got the WHO standards for PM 2.5s to be met by the WHO's own timing of 2030 is absolutely crucial. I posted a, a link to a briefing that Friends of the Earth signed up to. I mentioned the Healthy Air Campaign joint briefing and the British Lung Foundation have got an actual sort of action where you can just actually tell your MP to sort of do the right thing when, when it comes back. I mean, it's quite blunt because obviously there's a particular committee and not all MPs are on it, but it still helps to give some noise if, if people feel individually like doing that or trying to encourage people to, to lobby their MP. I think that could only be a good thing. Yeah. Okay, well I'm going to finish there, but I am just going to say that I'm going to use that as a link because tomorrow Ulster Friends of the Earth has another meeting specifically with Annalisa Dodds as some, most of you will know, is MP for Oxford East. And our target is to lobby her about a green and fair recovery. Transport is a really big issue for that. So anyone in and around Oxford, all the information is on our website and on the Oxford Friends of the Earth um, Facebook page. We're meeting with Annalisa online at 5.30 tomorrow afternoon. But I'm gonna finish now and say thank you to all our speakers to Lynn, to Kayla, to Felix who's had to rush, to Tom who's rushed, and to Jenny. I think this does show the value in a way of having Zoom. It would have been difficult to pull all these speakers together had we all had to be in the same place at the same time. I'm hoping that we will be able to do that before too long. But in the meantime, let's recognize the benefits of being able to meet online and draw some very different people together. I hope you found it a useful evening and I hope you've been a little bit inspired to think, okay, this is not just clean air day and we'll go back to other things tomorrow. This is clean air day and the start of clean air campaigning for the year ahead. So thank you all very, very much for this. And I'd like to especially thank Jackie, who's done an enormous amount of work on this event. And um, please stay in touch. Thank you. and. Um, Thanks very much, Jack, J Jenny, and all the speakers. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, and um, we will end it there. Thank you, Thank and good you, night. Chris. Thank you. Good night. Good Bye. night. Bye. Bye.